it was right up here in between the median. Uh, we couldn't move it. Um, so we, we ended up basically just digging a hole and uh, burying it right there and covered it with hay. We tried to move it and it just ripped apart. Uh, it wouldn't stay together. When a road is built through an area in which groups, a group of animals have been living, um, it just artificially truncates the space that they, that they live in. Uh, might create a barrier if they're not disposed to move across it, but otherwise it, you know, it's still there and uh, if they have to move from point A to point B and a road crosses it, well, they're going to cross the road. Hard surface roads are probably not unlike uh, rock shelves, for example, that might just naturally occur. In a sense, a, a road might not be too different from the natural world the animal lives in. What is different, however, is uh, not the road itself, but the, uh, the users of the road. You know, so an animal's sort of sensory ability, how do I move, what do I feel under me, may not be affected by the road. But cars barreling down the road, producing sound, lots of sound often, and uh, you know, at night with bright lights and the like, these are probably sensory input, sensory experiences that lots of species are not well adapted to. Animals are pretty much always on, on the move. Uh, they have ranges, they have territories where they live and, and make a living. They've got to go out and forage for food. Uh, they move around the areas that they live in looking for shelter, looking for water. Over time, animals uh, learn to utilize particular paths, particular trajectories through the habitat that they that they live in uh, and roads new roads certainly in, interrupt that my family used to go to Pennsylvania hunting every year and um, that's all you see on the sides of the roads down there it's just because there's so many they're just lined up with dead deer on the side of the road the data you know, there are probably more deer killed in automobile collisions than, than are killed by hunters, or at least the, the numbers are pretty close. Uh, no one counts the squirrels, but, but uh, that's got to be the major source of mortality for squirrels and possums and raccoons and skunks. Um, it, it's, it's serious carnage. five animals with my car. A wood thrush, a barn swallow, a chipmunk, a cottontail, and a possum. And I remember vividly all five times. And there was nothing I could do to avoid them. I, I certainly didn't seek to do that. <clears throat> the one that sticks in my mind the most vividly was a cottontail rabbit. And I was driving in Montague, and all of a sudden there was the rabbit, and there was no avoiding it. But I didn't kill it right away. <laughs> So I backed up over it <laughs> to kill it. And I just felt so sad and so bad about it. But it was like just sort of flopping around in the road. And I just didn't want it to suffer anymore. So that's what I decided to do. And it was really, really traumatic for me. And our vehicles, you know, animals don't know about our vehicles. And they don't, they can't, um, they don't know how to adjust to them. This guy here ran into the side of a car also. See, his head is a little tilted. We had a chiropractor come in here and worked on his, because he was so bad. But he got to the point where he was getting too big, so he couldn't work on 
So we never did get it completely straightened out. But if they run into the side of the car, which kind of screws up their brain a little bit for a few days, usually we can save those. And we've got this year we've gotten three, and we've saved all three. According to the state, they just had a thing on it because Bill Green was up here, and they uh, they said I think it was last year it was like four thousand deer to kill. And uh, percentage-wise, what we get a lot of times don't make it, especially if they get hit in the front, you know, crossing and they get hit by the grill and stuff. You get too much internal injuries. When I'm driving and I see a dead animal, you know, I'm, I steer so I don't hit it over again because it's an indignity to the dead body and I don't want to crush it further. But I often look at the cars coming behind me and everyone does the same thing. You know, they're, they're not they're not wanting to do it further or crush the body of the dead animal. They'll steer around it. But I read, and I imagine there are people who would do that and, and who do intentionally run over particularly snakes. Small stuff along the side of the road, you'll end up always somebody trying to see if they can hit turkeys, baby ducks, raccoons. The majority of them are young people. They're with some friends and trying to show off. And we had them had one and tried to run over a bunch of turkeys right in South China. And the woman was on her lawn videotaping the turkeys. So the kid, kid didn't have much of a chance because they got the plate and everything else. And he landed up going to court. And he landed up coming here for, for a while. One of them was going up the hill up here, passing lane, well, was in the breakdown lane. It was mother duck, mother wood duck had been hit and killed and only one of her ducklings survived it. All been run over in the breakdown lane. And there was another one a couple of years ago out on River Pond Road. A car full of young boys saw a turtle in the road and they figured it'd be fun to run over it. People just don't slow down. They don't slow down for whip for, for people. Why would they slow down for a bunch of ducks? I do feel, I don't know if I should be saying this, but I do feel there's a certain segment of the population that glorifies killing. And they get pleasure out of killing. And they don't have, a, they don't have a, an emotional connection to the creature. And to them, it's just another notch in, in the belt. When it's ritualized, I think, and, and culturally endorsed, that's one thing. When it's this kind of random, oh, there's a help this critter, I'm going to run over it. I mean, that's, that's ghoulish. Uh, and, and, and I think most people would, would, would respond just as I have, saying, that's sick. Whether it's, a, you know, a tortured childhood or, or, or something pretty traumatic, I would, ha I would think. Uh, makes, produces sadism, basically. Um, the, the enjoyment of, of tormenting, killing, for some it's small children and, and spouses, um, and for others it's animals. Um, something that we see with kids a lot, and maybe Mariah and I talked about it a little bit earlier, is I think, I think even at a very young age, students uh, uh, people want to possess. Like we go out and we catch salamanders, and my, my nieces and nephews, they put them in an in a aquarium and they want to keep them, and they want to keep them. And I say, well, we're not going to be able to meet their needs. You know, they're probably going to die. No, 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 I don't want to let them go. I want to keep them, I want to keep them. And somehow the possessive instinct is really strong, and I, I don't quite know what that's about. But with, with domestic pets, we're in control, you know. We, we're basically owning them <laughs> and wild animals are, th are this other you know they're separate from us and we don't control them and in fact sometimes <laughs> they do things that harm us or, or endanger us possibly um, so maybe that's part of it you think that kind of ownership complex that has anything to do with the like why people like to kill I do those animals 
they're mine. You know, I can do whatever I want with them. I can run them over and just kill them. It, it doesn't matter. You know, there's not, I'm not aware of a system out there that, that includes them, that they're part of, that's intricate, that's complex, that's balanced. They're mine. I can do whatever I want. Maybe that's part of it. Just the thought of it, even when you were moving the deer down there, I was like, uh, <laughs> not, not one of my strengths, having a strong stomach. Um, my old crew leader used to love it. when, Whenever there was a dead animal, he'd inspect it and try to see where it got hit and move it around. and Like crime scene investigation. Yeah. yeah. It just seems intuitively obvious that there's got to be a desensitization of some sort that, that to see these carcasses along the side of the road, you know, quite frequently. Does it desensitize you or does it remind you that, you know, that all animals, including you, are mortal? You know, I don't know, you know. You know, people, people have sort of oddly romanticized views of wild animals. And so, you know, uh, all you have to do is see one actual act of predation you know, by some carnivore predator on something else. And, uh, you know, what does that do? Desensitize you, shock you, you know? Uh, most people don't realize that, you know, lots of animals are making a living by, you know, by sinking their teeth and claws into the living flesh of other animals and then ripping them apart while they're still alive and consuming them. You know, well, that's what they do. There began to become, uh, over the course of the 20th century, what I think can fairly be called a romanticization of wildlife. A lot of people point to the, the popularity of Bambi as a cultural high water mark or a, or a point that, that began to change public attitudes. Humans romanticize some animals and, and not others. So uh, there's a class of animals, at least in our contemporary society, which, you know, uh, Biologists, animal behaviorists sometimes call charismatic megafauna, you know, the big ones that we make a fuss about, you know, so the Siberian tiger, the wolf, you know, the golden eagle. People care about it, they worry about extinction, they uh, romanticize them literally, which is to say they spin romances about them. They like to have a, a vision of what they're like, what their lives are like. You know, take a Siberian tiger, you know, a beautiful white tiger, you know, I mean, of course, endangered Himalayan tiger. Um, you know, we, we value that. But, you know, uh, porcupine, not, not so much. You know, a rat? Well, even less. Nobody romanticizes rats. I mean, the best you get is, is sort of cutified versions of it in, you know, Secret and Im or something. We like to romanticize things that we think are more like us because, you know, well, all right, they are mammals. They've got eyeballs that remind us of us, you know. Um, and then we like to really romanticize them by, uh, by projecting onto them, which they may or may not have, but, you know, feelings, internal states that make us think that they, we, they are really like us, you know, that they have experiences of the, of the world around them like us. There's nothing bad in valuing something. So if, if having these ideas helps you to value anything, you know, then that's, I think, a, a, a good thing. Some would say, I would say, that there's a virtue in having a, an, a, an understanding of the way things really are. You know, there is a real, really are out there. to uh, anthropomorphize wildlife uh, to an extreme uh, confuses what's important about wild animals and what's important about ourselves. Many people are willing to make a deal with deer, for example, that we'll plant ornamental shrubs that you like to eat and you'll be our lawn ornaments. Well, deer aren't lawn ornaments. 
I mean, there, there shouldn't be lawn ornaments. Uh, and 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 to to screw that relationship up uh, is 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 to diminish the deer uh, and to diminish us. And the worst thing you can do is make pets out of them. They're wild. You got to keep them that way because once you let them go, if you've made a pet out of it, it becomes a nuisance animal. A nuisance animal will end up either getting killed by a cat or somebody will shoot them. And the animal is always the one that's going to pay the price, no matter what happens. So we try to keep them as well as we can. These guys we release in the spring, so they've got all summer to get acclimated to their new surroundings and stuff, and away from people. Thoreau's famous comment, uh, in the wild is the preservation of the world, is, is, bears deep thought and consideration. That, that is to say that, that preserving the distinction between us and animals, wild animals, uh, is, is, is important for us to understand who we are as well as who they are. I am constantly amazed at how little people know about nature. And it's not that they're not interested, it's that they have no experience. They're, they want to know. They come to us because they want to know. And even the simplest facts, they don't know. And when, when I tell them or when they're investigating, they find stuff out there just so fascinated. Um, so I, I don't think it's that people don't care. I think it's that their lives have moved so far away from nature and from any connection to nature. The best that could be said maybe is that, is that roadkill provides you know, some evidence to people who might otherwise not have thought about it, about the presence of these animals. So I, I don't know if seeing roadkill desensitizes us to animals, it may, but I almost feel like it's the opposite. Like our, our lifestyle, our increasingly urbanized, increasingly technology-oriented lifestyle is drawing us away from animals. So maybe it makes it less, less impact, impactful to make a sick pun. We just, we don't know. We don't know the history of the animal. We don't know the life history. We don't know that these, that the salamanders that we'll talk about live for 15 years. So crushing one under your tire has a huge impact on the whole population. People don't know that. My life has been incredibly enriched by my relationships with non-human creatures. I can go walk anywhere in the, you know, in the Northeast or anywhere in the Eastern US, and I know stuff. I, f I find a place to belong, and I can relate to the plants. I find a way of belonging when I see black cherry, when I see white oak, because I know I know about its life history, and I know about its, some of its adaptations, and some of its um, interactions with insects and predators. And it, it helps me uh, be grounded in my life. And people who don't have that, I feel really sad for. And I, I would feel a lot less grounded if I didn't have that. It's the natural systems that sustain life. And even from the most selfish human, you know, human focused um, standpoint, without those natural systems, we, technology is not gonna save us. I, I try to really carry a reverence for all kinds of life. I, I think our species has lost the reverence for all species of, of life that are accompanying us on the planet. And I used to be really sad about that, and I am still really sad about it. But I think it's absolutely critical to our survival on the planet that we carry a reverence for all the creatures that are here on the planet because the natural systems are what maintain life. And we're not going to survive if the natural systems get too compromised.